Okay. So welcome everybody again uh, to this policy breakout session. Let me remind you uh, a bit the idea behind uh, this uh, this section. The idea is that uh, we should catch this opportunity to um, propose uh, and discuss. Uh, uh, practical actions uh, regarding policies uh, and uh, possibly to um, agree on uh, a timeline for them uh, and uh, practical milestones. So uh, the idea is that uh, everybody should be enabled uh, to suggest uh, actions uh, through the chat uh, and then uh, we'll uh, start discussing them uh, and uh, add them uh, in uh, the document that uh, you can see on your screen. So I think the, the floor is yours. At the moment in the chat, we only have a comment uh, which by the way, I think it's very relatable, which is from uh, the channel. Best practices are a very good idea, especially for terms of use, uh, access policies, and privacy, and privacy policies. Uh, for user documentation, in my opinion, it is more difficult because it strongly depends uh, on the services. This was a comment related to the discussion. To this, <laughs> yeah. Memory, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but on the other end, uh, it seems like a good starting point because you uh, you told us uh, one thing that is very good for policies, for the policy part. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can complement my sentence by saying that uh, probably what we should uh, define for the user documentation is that is mandatory. So the documentation, the user should exist. It should aim uh, uh, at uh, providing info enough information to the prospective user to use the service. But apart from this, I am really not sure what else we can uh, ask for. Uh, another comment totally disconnected with this is the fact that uh, the items uh, I've put into the discussion uh, section of this uh, of this doc shared document are um, have been discussed uh, within EOS Pillar, so they are proposed by EOS Pillar to for the discussion today. Uh, and uh, also, I think that uh, there is another another one I would like to raise now. It is the fact that. Uh, well, it is also a technical item and this will be probably discussed already there, but in my opinion, it is also a policy item. And it is the extent for the interoperability between catalogs. For the time being, we have heard by George that it is only possible to make a unidirectional fetch of information between catalogs from the national regional to the EOSC one and all, only for services. It is important to understand if there is the need and the possibility to onboard all to, to transfer information also about the service provider. For service providers, not only the, the resources associated to a specific resource provider already present in both catalogs. And also the other direction from the EOS catalog to the national one, because if uh, a service provider or a group of service providers have already onboarded their services into the EOS catalog, we don't want to ask them to register again into the uh, national catalog. I don't think we should have the discussion here because it was ra raging in the chat, but that runs into the PID question, which I think 
we can just say as a proposal, we need a meeting about service and provider PIDs, and it has to happen quite soon. Um, <clears throat> and it, because there's all sorts of questions about updating things and what's the definitive source and do you avoid things being onboarded multiple times, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some sort of identify is the only way to do it. And do you have a, a suggestion about the timing of such a meeting? I mean, the problem is, it's probably going to be after the summer, isn't it? I mean, we can try and do it before, but it depends. The, it's, we're now in July, and we assume for most places, especially those in, uh, in EOSC Pillar, August, it doesn't exist. So if, if it's not in July, it's in September, right? Yeah, and that's probably more realistic. However, I think it would be a good idea to start discussing about the date because, uh, you know, uh, with holidays and everything uh, and, uh, and also calls cl closing in September, I think that uh, September will end in a second. Well, I think the thing is, because I think we're going to end up having to suggest various different discussions that have to be had, is if we collect what the list is, we can maybe prioritize them and think about timing them. But I think we need to know what are the other ones as well. Otherwise, we'll just keep redoing it for all of them. Okay, so I think we can come back to this. Uh, unless there are other comments on the, on the timing here, I think we can come back uh, to, to the exact date. Uh, afterwards uh yeah one thing uh, because I, i'm seeing uh, the discussion i was about to, to respond to nina okay that's the document but please uh, um the idea is that uh, you put your suggestions here in the chat and at the stage uh, uh not all participants uh edit directly the document uh, this is just uh, to keep an order uh, uh, in the topics otherwise it will be difficult so if um, if you have suggestion please use the chat let me grab one other one in the chat as well um which we will do from your future which is to have some sort of shared space for documentation uh, or at least the documentation of the processes and the profiles and things like that so we have a, an onboarding space in the wiki for EOS Future. We have one previously that supported Enhanced EOS Cub. Um, and I have intended to make this available to people from the other catalog owners or regional and thematic projects. So I don't think it should be public, but I think it should be um, relatively open on request. And this is something that we'll do in the next couple of months. I mean, it's there already, I've just got to, get time to make sure we have the right user group to set up. So I think it's probably the same sort of timeline. Time yeah, that seems uh, really useful. Uh, and uh, But I, I don't think at the stage uh, you need, um, I mean, this is something you're offering as uh, your future. So there is well, nothing yeah. you need from our side or well, do you we'll, think it we'll would need be to know what needs to be there and we need other people to agree to use it. That's the point. So, for instance, I assume EOS Future will take on the ownership of the uh, profiles from EOSC Enhance because Enhance ends in November. I'm hoping, obviously, we'll take it on a little bit before November because we don't want to have this kind of crash into each other. But that would mean that would be the place we'd use for collecting feedback on the profiles as well. And we'd need people to agree that they would, they would do so. Um, so I think it's more like agree to use a shared space we'll provide one but we have to have the agreement to kind of buy in to do it mm -hmm. okay so are there, there uh, any comments on uh, this suggestion from uh, your future or um first feedbacks uh, whether you intend to To agree on this. Don't be shy, sir. <laughs> well, there doesn't yeah. seem to be any objections. <laughs> Should 
Shall we take this as a yeah, we will be using it. <laughs> Maybe they won't have much choice. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I frankly, whatever, like, if this is the OSC features decision, I believe, like, whatever makes it easier for, for that. Yeah, I think the only point here is in the past, we haven't really had that, which has been a bit of a shame. Um, so we should have it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it is quite difficult to disagree on the usefulness of such a space. Yeah, you think. <laughs> we hope. Okay, so let's uh, move by, on. By the way, Federica, I wanted to note uh, there was a point from EOS Nordic uh, from their slides, um, a proposal. So establish a clear method for integrating regional onboarding platforms into EOS core systems and make it easy and desirable for the Nordic and Baltic service providers to be part of the EOSC. Although I think this needs to be a bit more prescriptive. Yeah. And just to comment, this was a sort of summary point. It's not yeah. a concrete action. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I was about to say that uh, probably mm. if we want to make this uh, somehow actionable, uh, we need to mm. split it uh, in uh, more operational points. Yes. But this could be a good moment to do it. So <laughs> maybe if uh, our Nordic colleagues uh, want to comment a bit more, uh, uh, what was the reasoning behind this uh, summary point? Uh, sure. Uh, okay, I will uh, probably skip the desirable uh, <laughs> point. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, the on the policy level, uh, what is needed is to understand uh, uh, what are the representation requirements, or let's say, uh, how will uh, we assure that the representation rights of the service providers are validated, meaning that we are eligible to take uh, a specific service provider and pass its data to the EOS core. Uh, we can do it ad hoc. We can have a common EOS uh, requirement. So uh, ideally it would be common so that we can rely on the same procedure done by other uh, onboarded uh, services. And second uh, is, uh, so basically in a sense, um, uh, level of assurance for the representation rights for the uh, services. And uh, the second point is related to the, well, sort of second in interaction between the regional um, catalog and uh, EOSC uh, core. So whenever we are talking about any kinds of agreements, we need to understand that agreements make sense only between the legal bodies or legal persons, which uh, probably in our case does not mean physical bodies, but let's say some kind of organizations. So in order to get that information flowing, we need to have at least a skeleton for understanding between whom uh, these agreements would be made. And ideally, again, this would be a common template without, uh, you know, special deals with each specific catalog. So it would be common for regional, for thematic, for X, Y, Z. Uh, so we'll have a set of rules that we could rely that each uh, a local uh, provide a local catalog would assure about the services, uh, at least on the legal uh, representation rights. I mean, metadata description and so on. This can be, uh, in a sense, secondary. And the second one is the uh, policy about interactions between the catalog uh, and the EOS core. Uh, there is inform personal information flowing back and forth, uh, and as such, there needs to be also a privacy policy notice. Uh, and that means that uh, the earlier we uh, define these things, the better. Uh, there is a, a slightly different technical point uh, that we found out that basically we need to have a common AI solution for both regional platforms and uh, central ones. Uh, this is probably more technical than policy ones, but there is some implication of that on the pol policy level as well. So that's roughly uh, the split into policy uh, questions or proposals of uh, what was meant there. May I comment on this? Please go ahead. So for the template uh, for the agreement between the catalog 
operators, I completely agree. And I think that this could be one of the activities of EOS Future, specifically World Package 2. Owen, oh, do you think it is in scope? Yeah, so I think that there are a couple of things we can do here. We can break it down a little bit more. So the first thing is I think we should agree the agreement structure, as in the entities and the links between them, which is basically what Billy was saying. So I, in my intro slides, I basically gave what I think the structure is, which is that we need to have, so EOSC, the core, if, you, if you're on board directly, we will have some sort of provider agreement that needs to be aligned to the provider agreement the individual catalogs are using, right? So we need to come up together with, you know, agree what those things are called and a standard format for them. And then I think our kind of integration agreement, as I called it, or they can call it whatever you like, will obviously be based on the agreement we have for what the provider agreements look like, because it's basically saying, we've decided to align our provider agreements, we'll make sure that these things are done in roughly the same way. So I think the, 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 the agreement structure, we probably need really, really soon. And then we need to actually have the agreement templates pretty soon. This is indeed what we have in work package two of, of, of EOS Future. We have a task, it's not big, sadly, to basically coordinate this. So we're not gonna do it ourselves because it's not, it can't be unilateral, but it's to arrange the meetings with exactly you guys and others to, 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 to agree what this should look like and to work out what level of certainty we can have on, um, exactly as Ilya said, on representation. I think representation is probably gonna be the most complicated issue. The rest hopefully is a little bit more straightforward. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, so uh, the legal part, which is operating the EOSC core, would be EOSC Association, right? Well, at some stage, that's the problem. It will be EOSC Association after EOSC Future concludes. So I think these agreements are going to be... Okay, let, let's, we have to agree between us that there's the things we tell the public and the things we don't. We want to have an agreement in place where one of the parties is EOSC Future, we understand that that is therefore legally not an enforceable contract because EOS Future is a project rather than a legal entity, but we're proxying in for the legal entity which replaces us after EOS Future con concludes. Because as I understand it, it's, it's not going to be until EOS Future concludes that EOS Association goes from a sort of paper organization to an operational one. Okay, but uh, if we're already talking about signing the document, uh, for example, our legal department will not allow to sign a document with a project without legal representation. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if we're talking about actually signing something, we need at least some legal body that would be responsible for well, processing the uh, personal data of operators that we share with the EOS Corps. I'm not quite sure. We're going to have to come up with either a proxy or we're going to have to go for something short of a signed agreement. It's more like an MOU, if you see what I mean, which basically says we will we will follow the terms of the agreement, which will be legally signed after the project concludes. I mean, those are the only options I can see. Uh, actually, project but project. even if you have uh, um, an MOU, you still uh, need someone to sign it. So I think that uh, Ilias uh, object on uh, MOU is a MOU bit you can do. Yeah, MOU is a bit easier, but in that sense that uh, uh, we, we would not be able to claim that this is production uh, infrastructure till the things are signed, and I think this just needs to be made like more known to EOS Association as well. Yeah. Uh, that uh, I mean, this, there is some like uh, I mean, just now from the US Nordic perspective, I know that the uh, legal entity which is coordinating the US Nordic, which is Nordforsk, which is the uh, entity which combines sort of several Nordic countries, uh, it will not be operator of the platform uh, uh, for different reasons. Primarily because it's a funder that doesn't have the mandate of for service operators, so we'll have some. I don't know, some organization that will be doing that. And that organization will need to essentially collect uh, others' uh, info and push it further. So all these steps need to be covered. Um, I think that uh, the main issue will be from the fact that if we don't have the legally defined bodies who are clearly responsible, uh, even in the beginning, uh, so we don't have a sort of vision how it should be at the end, or we might not reach that end. Well, so, I think we, we have the we we have already or can have the vision. The problem is, I don't think 
any one partner within EOS Future will be necessarily prepared to take on the legal proxy role of making all of the agreements because they will otherwise end up in a situation where they're making promises, but the delivery from their end is reliant on everyone else in their consortium doing their job, unless we can fully take Nophilus into doing it, which I don't uh, think is very likely, unfortunately. I, I, I think this is totally okay, but the implications of that, and I think it should be made uh, clear uh, to the parties involved, that there will be no production system uh, before the agreements are signed. And uh, that probably is an, also a bit of stress on the EOS Association to actually, you know. Yeah, I mean, also let's let's real talk. I don't know how much of you, how many of you are aware of how the or, or the EOS Association is acting and how it appears to believe. My feeling is they are extremely nervous about taking on commitments at this stage. Uh, I don't know if Ignacio was in this group or the other one. I noticed him in the in the. Um, in the in, in the participant list earlier, you know, Theo Blanquer. Uh, but I mean, we can't use any of their email addresses. We can't pro put anything on their web on their website. Um, they basically don't want to take stuff on until after your future. Is, is, um, is my feeling. So maybe that's the thing just to say to them. The the payoff of that is we can't claim any of the agreement stuff is production. Because yes, and, we can't do the agreements. And the implication on that from the point of view, at least our original project, is that because our project ends before the EOS future ends, yeah. uh, we will not be able to claim that we have actually done the production integration of the EOS. And this will be, let's say, put into various documents. So this is uh, the implication on our side if we're not able to, you know, uh, get, uh, get proper agreements in place. I don't think it's like end uh, like end of the world. It's just that uh, we cannot silently assume that uh, Mo is enough for you know for production infrastructure. Well, I think we'll just have to we'll just have to be very clear about that. So we need a statement somewhere, and maybe this is another action that basically says for the agreement structure supporting EOSC until the 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 post EOSC future phase where EOSC Association takes on all the formal and legal responsibility. We will essentially use MOUs and we will attempt to follow them with the same force that we would with the legal contract, but they are not legal contracts or something, you know, like a, it's a best uh, effort uh, thing. Uh, like uh, maybe an action could also be that uh, we would uh, do the analysis on the application of uh, contracts not being signed. Sounds like you're volunteering. <laughs> um, uh, I can do that. Uh, well, I can delegate it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, in that sense, this is something that we have been doing in a similar project uh, where basically we cannot get an AI working because the signatures are not in place. So uh, there are some applications uh, here and we've been talking about data. Like whenever we have payments, for example, we'll suddenly have an issue that we don't, we need to trust the data. And if it turns out that the data is just randomly appearing, then we'll have an issue. So I think there are some implications of not uh, having proper agreements in place, which just need to think a bit about the plans and and then to kind of make uh, relevant parties aware of that. I don't think it blocks any of the technical integration It potentially blocks some of the sustainability models that could be tested out. But uh, other than that, I think it's just to, you know, to have a roadmap. To comment on that as well, if you look at the timeline of the task forces, which actually concerns me quite a lot, they don't start until September this year formally. And they, if I, I actually raised as an issue for the sustainability one that it doesn't produce anything until like another two years time or 18 months time, which means there's going to be no chance to test any of it anyway. I was hoping these things would take more momentum from the previous task forces, but I think we're going to see a lot of things not happen during the EOS future time, which we really hoped would happen not because of our choice. Okay, so. I think that this activity about uh, the exploring the implication is very important. So thanks, Ilya. But for, for the EOS future WP2 activities, I think that uh, at the, the definition of a template of the other agreement that should be signed by the individual operators of the catalogs with their service providers, in my opinion, could be really helpful. Of course, each catalog could go their way, 
uh, go its way. But uh, if we could should would be able to agree on a template also for this, it could be very helpful. So this should be an agreement between the operator, the catalog, and the service provider, which should deal with the rights the operator of the catalog operator have to be act on behalf of the service provider specifically when they will be uh, transferring information from the national original catalog to the ESQ1. Okay, so you, you say you actually need, uh, we, we actually need two templates. Yes. Well, you can look at the, my slides, but there's a put in a table which basically lists what I think the, the templates we need are. Um, so it's, we will have one, which is the kind of direct onboarding provider agreement. We presume every catalog has its own provider agreement. And then we need an agreement, which is between the core and the catalog. I think we can agree on perhaps <clears throat> we can collaborate to make a provider agreement, which can be used everywhere, or at least as a basis for what's used everywhere, because that's certainly going to make things useful. I think, again, what we should always be aiming at is not a single template to use, but a minimum set of content that everyone has to use, because every organization or region will have its own specific additional things they can, they can, they can add. So it'll be basic plus whatever you need regionally, rather than just one solution, probably. It's only an help to avoid that everyone starts from scratch. Yeah, and it's a big deal as well because you know locally things have been onboarded, and you will have to basically readdress your providers to say, and now we're going to put your data somewhere else. Are you happy with it? I mean, I assume that for most of the regional catalogs, there will be a flag which is also onboard this to EOSC, which won't necessarily be set for every resource because there may be some that you don't want to, to, to push into EOSC. And I think Costas, from your side using Agora, this was always planned, right? There's the things that you just want to keep for you and there's the things that you want to push into EOSC as well. So different, yeah, Costas agrees. Yeah, but there are two, two different things here. One is the possibility of onboard partial information related to a provider or a service. Uh, which uh, is uh, one thing. And the other thing is a total, uh, uh, total avoiding to the total uh, uh, transfer of information of a service or a provider if a provider doesn't want to appear in the EOSC catalog, for example. There are two different things. You're right. So it's a flag okay. for might be onboarded to EOSC and a flag for they agree to onboard to EOSC, something like that. Well, I, I always our the suggestion was that the provider will ask to be onboarded to EOSC. Otherwise, there is no there is no point of onboarding them to EOSC. It's the provider's choice if they will be onboarded or not. We can suggest to them, we can help them, we can support sure. them, but it's it's up to them. And because because they will need to maintain and follow the guidelines and the rules of participation and all the other policies uh, or mambo jumbo that needs to happen for to be onboarded in EOSC. Sure, the, uh, sure. It's a, it's a provider choice, but uh, uh, as soon as a provider wants to, I think uh, a template, uh, an agreement should be signed among them. Very simple, but uh, which should allow the catalog operator to act on behalf of the service provider to onboard the information into the S catalog. Yes, this is this will be useful, and also this will also help in the sense that you know, this will give the authority to, the, to a specific catalog to actually onboard the provider and its resources or not, or yeah. which resources, which helps a lot in the synchronization issue. If, for example, the genetics is to be onboarded from three different catalogs or something like that, or their our own, let's say, institution catalog. Yes. Mm. But still, that doesn't solve the problem. For example, if you, um, uh, let's take INFN, for example, which is a um, big organization with many, many departments, right? That doesn't give us, the, even if uh, INFN Catania or INFN, let's say, uh, Rome they, they decides to sign this contract, doesn't mean that the whole of INFN signs it. So that's also right. another question, which is about granularity of providers. 
Yeah. Because there's, and that's a real, it's come up a few times, and INFN is a good case for it, which is basically do we push people to only organize, onboard the legal entity once, but then it slows things down because you have to push it up to the corporate office, basically, rather than do it at the level where the actual research is happening. There are plus and minuses. Yeah, INFN, in my opinion, is not a good example because we decided in INFN that only the INFN as such has to be onboarded as service provider. Uh, but a different case, more and more similar to what you are describing is CNR. CNR is, is composed by hundreds of uh, independent entities, uh, institutes, and for them it will be more difficult. I think that the the INFN solution it, uh, does not fit for, for CNR, so it is a very important case. Even in the INFN use case where the uh, center headquarters you know, on board INFN as a provider, yeah. that doesn't mean that you the, the you have an easy way when it comes to services slash resources. Yeah, because you then need the central office to give permission to each of the different institutes to, to use their credentials. Yeah. No, but there is one, one important feature missing in the current uh, onboarding procedure. It is the fact that currently the resources have not the possibility to define specific admins for the resource itself. So he, he, now you rely only on the admins of the service provider, which poses some problems. But as soon as this will change and you would be able to define admins for each resource, I think that the problem will, would be solved. Yeah, I guess you still need some kind of authorization to be able to be a provider under an LSM to put to other service under INFN. Um, not, on, not everyone will be allowed to do so. See, that's one thing. And again, uh, this is a general point I want to make. This we is have to, We have to avoid putting in rules, which we can't check. So we're going to have to trust. We're going to have to give some advice to INFN, but then say in the end, they have to decide how they decide who gets to have the, the rights to onboard things internally. Yeah. Because otherwise, we get into just a total mess. Well, I think you should consider the implications, the legal implications, for instance. And uh, and probably this, uh, I know I'm the moderator here, but uh, on the other end, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce a question for you, uh, which is... Uh, Derika, uh, before we move to the question, just to finalize, to close the previous argument, perhaps you know, a way forward to uh, guide this solution is that to have some kind of departments or uh, kind of that level granularly between providers which will help, for example, now um, a, a specific institute under one provider or a specific, let's say- uh, So add a layer to the role model, yeah. basically. To give a bit more, let's say, let's say freedom on what they can do. It's a big yeah. change, but it's a, it's a one worth discussing. It's a big change, but it's something that really depicts the quite a few, uh, quite a few organizations and their structure out there which will help them move forward. My question now is, uh, do you believe that you can do this on paper or uh, do we need uh, a study to, to understand the implications uh, of the different options uh, there are here? I believe they, they, they require some study and what is the pros and cons on this? Because it's a big change in the whole structure of the files. Uh, sorry, just a quick comment on that. Uh, I think the whole idea of the regional portals is to conceal uh, the local processes. And in that sense, uh, putting the ability to have different roles uh, representing uh, organization and managing them into EOSC core uh, will have a huge implications on the development uh, of the EOSC portal, which I believe will not fit into the EOSC future project, correct me if I'm wrong. However, the whole idea, I think, of the original ones is that the original projects can capture that complexity and uh, translate that into the some straightforward concepts that are supported by the uh, EOSC uh, core services. So if we have a multi-step validation or approval required in order to publish the services, then putting the whole support for that into uh, EOSC uh, core 
uh, will uh, uh, well will make it quite complicated. On the other hand, locally you can have it significantly easier. You can integrate local INFN. I'm I'm sure if that's a, a valid uh, example. But if, for example, CNR and INFN could have their own catalogs that you just uh, sort of proxy through the um, through the uh, well uh, the regional onboarding. Then the important point from the EOS core is to make sure that uh, the operator of the uh, regional portal confirms that he has all the rights to you know to do that so we, we should not realistically aim i think uh, at grasping all the possible models inside the score this is too too complicated yeah uh, however if there will be the possibility for a service provider to onboard the service into their national catalog or into the ESQ1, uh, so the, the procedure should be similar. You cannot accept that uh, there will be different procedures at European and national level. Why not? I mean, uh, if we're talking about why we want to do that, is that uh, when you actually want to order something, then uh, you would like to know who is responsible for a specific service, right? Yeah. So how exactly that information gets there and how it's verified, there can be differences. So I think we should make sure that uh, the information that is present in, uh, in uh, core uh, uh, matches the expected uh, usage for that information. Um, and then uh, if the information is not uh, injected directly into core by, well, people, but by some delegated parties, then we need to assure that, that those parties uh, are, you know, uh, taking responsibility for making sure that that information is uh, correct. Uh, in that... <laughs> Sorry, continue. No, uh, just to finalize, uh, I think uh, I agree that it would be great if uh, we have a, a default scenario for the catalogs and provide also some typical uh, agreements here and there, but uh, then it becomes a bit more complicated if we have this kind of different types of organizations and maybe some local regulations and you know things that you can get really i mean some very detailed changes that you need to then take into account yeah but what, what i was meaning is that if you for example allow infn to onboard their services into the national catalog and this uh, requires some uh, grained uh, authorization steps uh, such as the departments and you do not require this at the EOSC level it will be a mess for INFM people to to understand what they have to do when they choose to onboard their services into the national catalog or into the EOSC uh, one yes but then it's a question uh, if it's allowed to onboard services i think somebody asked uh, initially about the ownership of the catalog or let's say the authoritative source of information so uh, if uh, if uh, we agree that uh, the uh, service provider can onboard into different locations in parallel uh, then we need to have a policy for deciding who wins or wh who whom to trust one option is to say that such things are not allowed. So as a service provider, you have to pick. Probably this is a bit too restrictive. And uh, if not, then you can say that unless something is proven, uh, you cannot, for example, be part of the ordering uh, functionality. So only services that are wide access or what's called public access. So basically when you don't care about uh, things so much uh, can be listed. I don't think this is the correct model, at least the one I have in mind. So the, the EOS catalog exists already now. The, the Italian catalog, for example, does not exist. So INFN has onboarded a number of different services into the EOS catalog. As soon as the national catalog will be available in Italy, we don't want to onboard again the INFN service into the national one. We want to uh, transfer the information from the EOS catalog to the national one. And if at that point, if there will be additional services to be onboarded, the model I have in mind is that we have INFN has the right to choose whether to onboard them into, uh, into the EOS catalog or into the national one with the implication that whatever is the catalog uh, 
they will onboard services into, they will be transferred, if I uh, in science, this agreement to the other catalog. So if there are different rules or different validation methods in the two catalogs, it would be impossible to do that. So what you are saying, if I understand correctly, is that you can have additional things happening at the level of the national or regional catalog or the USC central one, but not uh, things that are in contrast. So you, you have to agree on a minimum set of, uh, of rules and uh, information that are the same in both. Sure, for, for this to be available, to be possible, we need that uh, the, there is uh, uh, a, um, compliance between the profiles in the two catalogs, the validation procedure and so on and so forth, which should be part of the general agreement we were discussing at the beginning. Um, just to comment, uh, I agree with the common statement that there should be a common functionality, uh, or let's say the common uh, informational model supported by uh, by uh, both regional uh, catalogs and uh, automatic for that matter and uh, central ones. This is natural, otherwise we are not able to compare or you know, merge information centrally. Uh, what I think is that the way how you get to that information uh, could differ and uh, that the regional projects because of their closeness to the uh, let's say uh, all systems in place and the organizations in place can implement a significantly uh, more well either automated or easier process of validation of some of, of the information yeah. now uh, the problem can come if indeed uh, that okay catalog maybe is a bit uh, confusing uh, ter 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 terminology here because uh, Luciana do you mean like something that just shows you the data or some or like uh, this uh, provider portal that allows you to modify the information no, only to modify information because in this case basically uh, when we're talking about information modification we are aiming at some robot accounts sitting uh, at the service uh, platforms uh, of, for modifying that information so if uh, somebody goes directly to your know, score and modifies that then we'll have the problem that there are two different accounts that basically can modify the same information and uh, we need to support that somehow on the policy level uh, in my view, one of the options would be to say that, you know, you have to pick one or another. Either you do things uh, with your own accounts in, uh, in uh, EOSC uh, uh, core, or uh, sort of face the risk that it could be potentially overwritten by uh, original portals. Yeah, uh, this is very important, but uh, we, we have to understand what are the implications of the different choices and see what it is uh, achievable technically and, and also, and also Ilya, like because i agree and i agree with what both of you are saying i think the point is we don't want to do everything centrally but the central model has to accommodate the cases which the different regions bring so i think for instance it might be sensible to introduce the option of having an additional layer in the user model to accommodate the department or institute basically large entity under a provider because there will be enough cases where locally it will be needed. We don't necessarily have to tell everyone how to process it. We just have one set of processes for the provider in general to show that they are who they say they are, but that we need to, we need to kind of extract that as a requirement to go into the model we're using to, to keep the data. Okay, this seems already, uh, if everybody agrees, uh, something that can be translated into a concrete action. Uh, maybe we can try and have an to have an idea about the timing of such an action and uh, the steps we need. The problem there, and I don't think we have anyone, neither George nor Athanasia joined this meeting. No, it's a shame is that uh, this basically requires two things. It requires a change of the EOS profiles and then it requires a change to the technical platform as well. So the change to the profiles kind of goes along with how the profiles are managed. Right now they're being managed through Enhance. So we can put in a request for change with an RFC, which will be discussed. 
um, I will certainly support it. But after November and probably before that, that'll switch to somehow being managed by your future. And I think we have to come up with some governance way of doing that. I actually think that then also leads to another point, which is that the catalog owners need to be actively involved in the governance of the EOSC profiles because we're asking people to either use this or map to it. I, I think, Ilya, you don't use the profiles directly. You translate to them from your, your own format. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Well, we have actually several translations, so yes, yes. Yeah. But you still need to have a voice in how, that, how that's governed. So I think that's another kind of related to this. That's an important point. Um, We've actually mentioned this in the charter for the rules of participation task force, because that also will have to have some voice in how we manage this, these, these profiles, because otherwise we won't be able to implement things through them. So we'll see. On which also you should all join the task force if you're not joining another task force. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> so another point I'd like to pick from the chat is uh, the one that Sara, my colleague Sara Di Giorgio made uh, a few minutes uh, ago, which is adopt shared guidelines on IPR issues, taking into account the adoption of cross-licensing framework, uh, selecting uh, a selection of set, uh, uh, a selection of set of uh, licenses template, uh, ranging from traditional commercial exploitation to open access and open science format. Example, Creative Commons, uh, GNEU, GPL, uh, free and not exclusive patent licenses. Well, that's quite a lot of stuff, but the, the, the key point, uh, and maybe Sarah, you want to comment on this, uh, is that uh, uh, all the things we are discussing now have also legal and IPR uh, aspects uh, that should be taken into account uh, when we consider our use cases. Sarah, would you like yes. to comment? Yes, yes, because in EOS Pillar we have conducted quite an extensive study about the legal framework. And uh, yes, actually in the... Um, European countries, there are still gaps and uh, some issues on the IPR uh, management. And so uh, what we have um, decided is also to, to start reflecting on the similarity and also taking into account the different national regulations and providing some uh, guidelines uh, that helps uh, researchers in adopting, uh, in taking into account IPR issues and adopting the right, uh, uh, eventually, um, licensing, uh, licensing uh, for publishing the re data and resources. So uh, the things here is to, to reflect on this and maybe uh, to, um, to find out commonalities and try to help researchers in dealing with the IPR and GDPR issues and selecting, um, I mean, international standards licensing framework could really help in accessing data and resources. And yeah, this is uh, something that uh, in the policy, uh, and also in the agreement uh, with the provider, uh, we should take into account. I don't know if also uh, in the other uh, regional project, um, they have uh, taken this uh, study into account and if you have already some best practice that could help uh, this uh, process. Sarah, I have a question. You talk of IPR, but uh, you are probably thinking of uh, software or research products, uh, documents, uh, publications, so on and so forth. While for the time being, who, the, the catalogs uh, deal with services. Yeah, it, but also it, services, it yeah. But I don't see how the IPR applies to services. I mean, uh, services, if you mean services as application, they are also dealing with uh, IPR issues. I mean, um, especially, for example, if services are coming from uh, third parties 
or from also maybe there, there are also the, the private uh, private party, but also in the public uh, institution services has to be like application has to be accompanied by um, uh, by licenses. Some services could be also, uh, I mean, used and accessed under certain terms of uh, conditions. And so all this it's uh, regulated by uh, li by a license. Well, so you, you're mixing things up. I mean, app an application is not a service. The services use applications. Those applications have licenses granted, but then you, you jump from license to terms of service or terms of use, and then we get into SLAs. Like that's the level at which you need to consider things for the services. The, the services themselves have to do their own IPR management for the software and other entities within them which require licensing, but you don't do licensing at the service scale. Plus, much as I think it sort of sounds like a nice thing to do, I just like to kind of re-inject the same point, which is anything we try and apply globally has to be checkable by someone in a realistic amount of effort and in a relatively objective way. And this feels like an area where it's great to have some sort of generic guidelines that can be published and available for, for people, but we're not going to be able to go further than that because it's so variable depending on what you're talking about. And maybe I'm wrong, but I can't see a way to go beyond just some general guidelines on manager IPR. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. What about yeah, okay. the, um, the data protection part too? I think yeah. this is actually a very real and uh, comprehensive problem and uh, all services uh, as well as other uh, research products have that. Yeah, that's and a bigger question. It... <laughs> so <laughs> data protection, right? This is something that we can also say everyone has to have dealt with already before they come to the party because GDPR is in force in Europe. Now we know that realistically a lot of people haven't, but it's something that we can reasonably expect. So we can say you must have a privacy policy and a data protection policy that go along with your service or any resource that you're trying to offer. Well, service actually, resources don't need it necessarily. However, the problem there is, what do you check? So I am currently running the onboarding in EOS future. I have like 800,000 euros. I've got quite a lot of money to spend, but that doesn't give me lawyers to go and check everyone's GDPR statements. So we again have to think what is the, the realistic level of check that can be made of people's privacy and data protection policies. We can check they have one, that's fine, and that it looks roughly like it might be a data protection policy, but we're not going to do a legal check because there's no standard for them. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly you, you would also like to check uh, who's responsible for the for that uh, for the data protection in the organization which leads back to the problem uh, of having the legal entity versus uh, the um, department and um, no that's not the department set. issue i mean you can have that at the, at the organization level it, it does cause a problem if you're dealing with a project trying to onboard because they don't have the same level of certainty this is why we've been trying to push legal entities over projects is the best vehicle for onboarding because they have the legal responsibility to do GDPR. A lot of this comes down to the same thing, which is most things will be self-certified by providers rather than explicitly checked. And we will be removing people from catalogs when we don't think their self-certification is valid rather than actively checking things and positively saying, we agree. Me and Ilya have discussed this quite a lot. There are things we will be able to check. We can use VAT numbers to check which companies really exist in Europe. This is something we can automate. Things where we have an authoritative legal source of data, we can proactively check. Or things where it's uh, automatable like a URL, we can check it's an F a fully qualified domain name and we can ping it. But things like, did you give the right data protection officer? I mean, this is, this is outside the scope of what we're ever going to have effort for. So I think we have to be super careful in setting up the rules about the ones that we can apply. Otherwise, it's just a mess. Yeah, I understand, Owen. Anyway, it's, uh, I think that is, uh, it helps also to find out some shared common general guidelines that will help uh, researchers in, in dealing, I mean, a shared uh, approach. 
to IPR and GDPR issues. I'm sorry, but uh, it feels a bit, um, I'd say, it feels that this is not something that we should be discussing. This is uh, something that the EOSC Association should decide what kind of policies they should push. Uh, I believe that if we will tell our service providers, for example, in Nordics, that they should, you know, adopt some guidelines, they will just ignore us. Like these are mature services that already have stuff in place. So uh, I believe that the policies need to be, you know, pushed through the funding agencies to make sure that they are addressed and so on. It feels quite high, too high from the point of view of the integration of service catalogs. I think what we can do is we can start a list of things that we want to escalate to the association exactly along those lines of these are things which we've come across, we can't deal with, but we want someone else to look at. <laughs> Just to give an example, I think it would be very cool if we would be able to validate whether the privacy policy of a service provider matches the GDPR requirements. Now, uh, how exactly are we going to do that uh, is a big question. Uh, if there is a statement that this is something that needs to be done by your score as part of the onboarding, then I believe the impact will be that there will be more effort required for that, significantly more probably. So uh, alternative is to say that uh, this is, is the responsibility of the legal uh, body uh, that provides the services, and we just assure that uh, notice is present, but we don't go into the details of that, I mean privacy notice. Okay. Any other comments on these? Let me see. Yeah, well, Costas is commenting, and I agree. So, Costas. We need to be more practical. Uh, I agree. Chris. <laughs> No, let's let's be honest, right? It's it's already hard to onboard a service to attract service to be onboarded and maintained in, in years, right? If we start adding this this kind of legal barriers and all these, then it's, we're simply saying to them, uh, just ignore us. It, it they don't see they don't have any concrete let's say benefits. It's already hard. It's a hard discussion trying to say what they gain by being the in years. Besides the argument by EC that everything should be on, on EOS and according to your project, you need to onboard your services. Nothing else you know, is there out there as an incentive. They won't be able to gain money. They won't be able to gain effort or funding or whatever. It's 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 quite simple. And I believe that the whole of EOS and especially the EOS association seems to be to at least, at least have the same feeling from them, is that each provider is responsible for the services, resources, uh, data sets, whatever they are, pro they are providing, right? They have the rules of participation saying that you need to oblige to these things. If they are following GDPR, GDPR is a legal thing for whatever service you provide besides EOS. It's, there's, they will never scale out to, for, for us to be onboarding a number of services or resources if it's to do uh, to, to do GDPR validation for every service or every provider. It's completely out of, out of scope. We need a lead. Don't think, we need uh, a, it was we the need, point, uh, Costas. We need, I, a, I, we, need, wait, we need a lean and simple way so that you know, a really loosely coupled feder, federation of federations not a highly integrated federation where everything works on the same with the same way. This will never fly in the, in the scale of EOS is supposed to be. I agree, but I don't believe, uh, I don't know if Sarah wants to comment anymore, but I, I don't believe that uh, um, the, the total validation was ever the point. Was it? No, no, yeah. And no, I was mentioning more, uh, I mean, also in terms of um, the operative to support uh, uh, providers in trying to, um, to adopt a shared and common, uh, I mean, um, approach to IPR and GDPR issues, because this is, I, we know that it's uh, an, an issue and the problem for researchers. And so this is just a way to help researchers and also from the point of view of the EOS catalog to have harmonized um, access policies on, uh, on data and resources. But I no. think this is, this is important, but it is out of the scope of the onboarding okay. procedures. It, it is in scope of 
the various projects dealing with EOSC in some ways, but not of the onboarding stuff. Okay. Okay, so... I, if I might add to the discussion. Please. Oksana here. Thank you. Uh, from EOSC Synergy, but also from EOSC Portal perspective. Uh, I'm sorry because my connection was very poor at the beginning, so I'm not sure if it has been mentioned or not. But in addition to what Kostas has said, in EOSC Synergy, uh, we are a little bit out of scope here because we don't have catalog, but we do have, on, but we are onboarding uh, services in the central catalog. And uh, some suggestions or uh, inputs from the providers of the thematic services or regional services is the fact that uh, Costas has raised that some of the information, especially the legal ones, uh, are sometimes a bit too much for them for the sake of onboarding. And right now they are doing it because they are in synergy and we have a coordinated effort uh, to onboard. However, I know that in some other, because uh, some of the representatives, they have their own, uh, let's say, services that might have been onboarded but are not part of, of, the, of the project. And when the people see the form, they simply withdraw. And there are two, two main aspects to do so. First of all is the length of it and the number of information which is required and they don't understand why is it asked from them. And the second, uh, or even three. Second thing it was Costas has said, uh, the, the incentives uh, are not speaking out loud, uh, loud enough because people for now, when they see this, for them, complicated onboarded, onboarding process and uh, mm, positives that they may uh, take from, the, the math for them is uh, making them stop the onboarding process. And what might help is the understanding of why some information are needed, how will they be used, for which sake they need to devote their time to think about this kind of information that are asked for. And one very particular problem, I'm not sure if uh, this is something that is uh, happening in other 5B projects, but one very particular problem is about the ownership, but the catalog is one thing, but about uh, of the mere services themselves. Because uh, very often when providers come across the legal entity responsible for the service, uh, they don't know, they even don't want to put anything in that field. Uh, the reason for that is that they are not sure who will claim the ownership after the project ends. And I think this is one of the problems that has been already recognized, but uh, in my understanding, I'm not sure if uh, this is something that, where this, this problem, because it is a problem, should be discussed on which level that people, sometimes providers, do not want to claim the ownership of the services. They don't, don't want to sustain them after the project ends because they don't believe or don't have means to do so. But but then, why are they onboarding them? That's my problem, Roxana. Like the reason that we've had all these discussions about legal entities is because if we, if we don't have, otherwise we're just putting them there in order to make the project look good because they don't really believe anyone's going to use them. We have to have I, some push towards a more sustainable structure. I, I totally agree. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that there is a problem that people uh, don't want don't want to take the ownership, and I'm not sure how to deal with that. I think somebody should tackle this problem in general. Unfortunately, I'm not I'm not giving you any solution here. Well, there is a solution, and it's straightforward, and it comes from the funding agencies, which is that yeah. it's a requirement in order to pass your final review that you have enough sustainability of your services that you've decided who's going to take them on. And I think there has been a push by the EC to make projects look at sustainability and, and innovation management earlier. It's, I mean, for Horizon Europe, you're going to have to submit an initial plan with the proposal and you're going to have to update it in month six. So this is new stuff, right? You won't be able yeah. to get away with last month innovation and IPR plans, which is good because they sucked. They were terrible and they caused us lots of problems. I'm sure Rob has been stuck doing those things from the communication side before. So I think, and I think this also goes to the inducement question, which is that in the end, the inducements to use EOSC 
are going to have to be derived from the funding agencies in the EC because they have to come up with a way, and this is out of our scope, that people get paid for the services that they use through EOSC outside of their whatever their initial grant was. So there, there has, otherwise there won't be a point for EOSC to happen at all because you'll be putting things in that you can't afford to let anyone use. So we have to, I guess, trust that there will be those inducements and those reasons, and we have to escalate that issue again, even though we've done it a few times. Um, but I think we also have to kind of try and push people to be a bit stronger. I think the best point you've made there, Roxana, is that we should state for each piece of data we capture, why we want to capture it, so that the providers feel that we're doing this more purposefully. And this would also be compliant with GDPR, where you're not supposed to collect data that you don't have a reason for collecting. I also think that related to that, we should re-engineer the profiles, not delete everything and start again, because this will shoot me anyway, but hopefully not right away. <laughs> but we should at least separate out the required from the optional, because right now, as you go through it, basically in the profiles for each section, there's like two or three required and 30 optional fields, which basically yeah. makes it seem more padded. I think if we rearranged it to be the core required stuff, and then a bunch of optional stuff you don't even have to go into in order to submit, this would make things far, far less imposing. But there are some things, like do you have a privacy policy, which I think it doesn't matter if it's hard for the providers, we have to ask for a privacy yeah. policy. This should be a basic kind of hygiene factor. Costas is calling me stupid, which isn't entirely unjustified. Because he loves <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, I'm actually calling the profile stupid, but yes. <laughs> I mean, again, this is a big point. The profiles were done unilaterally in a rush to have something integrated between the old EOS Cub and the InfraCentral standards. No, Version okay. four of them has to be simpler. Get involved now so that we can make sure version so that it's not just me voting for a simpler structure next time. Otherwise, it will be, and, uh, and I may not win. It needs to be simpler and needs to be modular. It needs to be a lot, a lot for a lot Preach. of this information we collect doesn't really help. Nor the providers; they're not even present in the marketplace side. Yeah, they, I mean, they would the, have the two different classifications in, in the in the same thing, and people don't understand what they what they, they're there for. The Merrill stuff is a big issue for that because we, we ported a whole load of stuff to keep Ian for Central happy because they also run the Merrill and Catris catalogs. And it basically is a whole load of bloat about which stage of the ESFRI lifecycle roadmap you want, which obviously applies to only, the, only those entries. And that stuff's fine, but it should all be in a block called RI data or something like that, which you don't even click on unless you want to. It's one of the menu of options. And yes, Ilya, in the end, I'd love to embed the minimal profile in, in, uh, info into the PID. We'll have to see if that's possible, but it would be, uh, that would be an aspiration. I'm not sure why it's not possible. Yeah, I, I'm not a PID expert, so I don't know how, how much data you can carry along with your PID. Exactly, as much as you agree, that would be carried in a certain profile if it's for the services. And for example, there is a PID service provider inside uh, EOSC. Uh, we can sort of say that the EOSC information about, the, sorry, information about the EOSC services would be kept in that service. I also don't care which PID service it is. So for all the politics involved, you know, it can be EUDAT, who my own organization ends up competing with. Fine, we just need a PID solution. I'm really open to whatever technology you guys want to use. First of all, I think yeah, you know, that PID might not be the best fit, although... Maybe I don't mind. That's all, all I'm saying uh, is that... Really yeah, like... <laughs> but uh, what I want to say is that uh, I think we should include the discussion about the PIDs here because there is the EOSC PID policy, which claims that it's uh, applicable also to the um, services in the long run. And uh, that means that when we're talking about information update into the uh, EOSC uh, registry, and we're talking about PIDs, we are talking about exactly the same set of uh, issues. And that is that we need to have a, um, like if EOSC registry trusts some PID, then you essentially trust the regional automatic service provider. So uh, then the, comes the question as uh, who pushes the data, who registers the PIDs. So I think that we should uh, be, uh, let's say, uh, indeed having this discussion, uh, also including the 
uh, question of PIDs in mind. Uh, you're right, Owen, that uh, I think somewhere before you mentioned that the main reason why we need PIDs to essentially figure out if the service is uh, already in or out. Uh, however, the concept of PID typically involves other uh, attributes as well, which are used for linking, for versioning, and so on and so forth, uh, which, uh, if we adopt it, could provide added value. So I think that um, we should either say that this um, the duplication of information is our only goal, or that if it's not the only goal, then we should take into account uh, policies related to publishing of the PIDs of into mature services uh, that provide the PIDs. Okay, so um, to translate this into uh, a practical action, considering also that uh, uh, in um, uh, 15 minutes, uh, we have to move uh, to this is the, the plenary second again. Point. This is action two, basically. Just that uh, catalog operator, if that is a PID operator, then basically we need to have some agreement there as well. Okay. Uh, what about uh, uh, coordination uh, with the uh, PID task force uh, in the EGESC implementation work uh, advisory group? There's also some PID work in your your future WP4, which I have to say I'm not involved in, so I don't know about it. But I know that there are some people involved. But uh, during the plenary, there were some comments in the chat against relying too much on this task force. No, I said not the task force. There's also some work, like actual technical person months within the OSC future to do work, as well as the task force. But you're right. The, it's a big question of how agile. Also, the task force is not starting till um, September. Really, is not great. I thought this. Yeah, I didn't. Think yeah, but you good. you want to coordinate with it anyway. We will have to. So. No choice. <laughs> so I tried to state the the profile redevelopment uh, as a suggestion in the chat. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I see. So oh, it's see. there in the in the proposals. So I think we we should now close up. So the proposals are there, and I think uh, we have discussed at um, uh, at length. Mm, probably we want to go a bit more into the timeline. Do we? Is there uh, any comments on this? Uh, I mean, this has to happen this year, so the discussion needs to start soon. So I think that um, EOSC Future and Enhance have to start this because Enhance currently owns the profiles as much as they're owned. But it has to include everyone else, and there needs to be some sort of structure for that. Do you believe that you need some kind of reinforcement uh that the propositions and requirements that you might uh, might bring to the table for the um, for the profile discussion and enhance and in and in future might need some proof or backup from this meeting like what you have said that you don't want to be the only one who, uh, who well the problem is the... right now the way it works is there are requests for change that come from a bunch of places that are discussed in private by enhance and that has to stop mm -hmm. The group which discusses change to the profiles needs to include all of the stakeholders of the profiles. So that should be the people from the future consortium, people from Enhance while it lasts, but also people from the 03, 04, 05, and 07 projects. They should all be able to join that group if they want to. So and my that's what I want to do. Yeah, that, that's my vision, at least, because otherwise, what's the point? I mean, I can define something as the else future and you guys will all say that's silly. We're not going to do it. There's, there's no benefit to it being closed. So it's more like draw in other people in the discussion. And have a roadmap as well. So the action is on who? It's going to be on us again. That's the problem. 
well, put it this way, I would very much like to hope that the people who are in the EOS Future Consortium, as well as in the other projects, which should, hopefully is most of you, will help me with some of this stuff within the EOS Future, because otherwise it's, if it's all on me, it won't get done. Well, it's on you anyway to initiate uh, the process. Yeah, we have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think uh, uh in five minutes uh we'll be ending this uh parallel session so i think it, it is time to double check our list and uh if there is something you believe it is missing uh, from uh from the list uh, now it's your chance to to point it out I think we agreed on this action, but it, we just didn't define a timeline. The analysis on the implications of the uh, agreement. Uh, I think that, generally speaking, the high level analysis could be done quite quickly. So I think that we can, I don't know, for, I mean, the main parts, so uh, we can do the draft probably during July, August. It's a bit of vacation season now, but let's say August. Okay. Thank you. And do you plan to to invite others to to join this activity? Because we 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 noted down uh, this as uh, an action on you only. But maybe you are interested in. Uh... Uh, yeah, for sure. I think that in practice we'll just first circulate that with the uh, let's say uh, well, within the onboarding team or whatever it's called now, eBot. Uh, and uh, and then uh, I'm guessing Owen <laughs> would say what else to do with that implication. Yeah, we'll do something. <laughs> no, we'll feed it in. It'd be great if, if someone else is taking the lead, that would be wonderful. But again, yeah. the, what you said about the EPOT is interesting because that's why I had the earlier action of having a space for us to draw other people in. Because right now it's only the people who actually do the onboarding. Or is actually I'd like to draw in the people who have a, like a voice on the policy issues as well. I well, think it, it is important to uh, constantly update on, on the progress of these uh, actions uh, also uh, on the service onboarding task force among the 5B projects. Because not all the people discussing this, interested in this, are in the epoch. No, and that's why I say we need to have some larger grouping or space to have these discussions um, that involves the people from the other projects as well. But we covered that as the whatever, both, uh, where is it? One of the actions, the September 2021. Yeah, we have that one. So this is essentially the start of it. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. This Mo that is mentioned, uh, is there some kind of work package with an effort to help to draft that uh, memorandum of understanding? Yeah, WP2. We have a little bit of effort. I've got a little bit of time, says Mark, but it's to coordinate. It's not to do the whole thing. So me and Mark had a meeting last week or two weeks ago to, to basically kick this stuff off. And then you'll start hearing from us on that pretty soon. But I kind of, it's all the same work, right? It's just which bucket we choose to put it in. So the effort we have in WP2 in, in EOS Future is to cover um, interpreting the rules of participation into, into criteria um, and the uh, assessment of the competencies we, or the capabilities we need for EOS Core and to basically set an agreement structure for moving things between catalogs. Okay, so this MO is basically the latter, right? And we all agree that the, during the EOS future lifetime, realistically, this would be the... Uh, the, the it's probably as certain as we can get. There may be cases where we can make agreements, but we'll have to see. We'll see if anyone's prepared to proxy, but I don't, yeah, probably it'll be a, a, a memorandum. Of understanding. Okay, so for the other practical purposes, it should for, aim to become the proper contract that would be eventually yeah. signed. Let's call it a proto-contract rather than just an MOU, but it's the pre-contract, should we say. 
Okay. So we'll try and have the same terms, but it, we just have to understand the, the applicability is different until we have clear legal entities in place. There is another point there, which I will just very briefly mention, which is EOSC Future has been invited to give input to the European Commission on the procurement for the EOSC core services after EOSC Future uh, concludes. So this can only be done transparently because obviously there's quite a lot of self-interest from a lot of us, but we have a pathway to inject at least suggestions of requirements or specifications to the EC for what comes after EOSC Future um, when they do, we will procure these services rather than do them through projects. So we can ask them to include things like needs to use the EOSC profiles because we've spent five years agreeing on them or something like that. So we have some path to try and make some of this stuff sustainable as well. But the procurement action in Horizon Europe is foreseen in 2022. Uh, starts then, but there is, will be a procurement for running EOS core to basically dovetail with EOS feature. That's the plan. So how do you suggest to translate this into uh, that's not, an action? That's more like just, it's more like an output from a lot of the actions. I was just saying that there is a way we can inject this. So like the contracts, we can create a pre-contract and then we can say, we can suggest to the EC that they take this as the basis for the procurement so that that is the contract structure that's taken on after the project concludes. So we have a way to try and make sure these things actually go, are sustained. Okay. As to the last proposals, personally, the top one, I think, is is that already in somewhere? No, no we'll that see. should be agreed, I think. Yeah, we just need uh, who is the owner um, and the timeline. The owner is probably EOSC Future again, and the timeline is going to, I mean, unfortunately, the, the unless someone else wants to take it on, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else I can do. And I think that it would be probably October, September, October. And what about PID operator? I don't know. I don't know if we have the certainty here. I think there needs to be a discussion about PIDs, but I don't know that we can set that. Well, maybe this can be a memo for a uh for the workshop uh, on PIDs we are planning in September. Okay, sounds good. And we are perfectly in time. Thank you for this. We have three minutes uh, before we convene uh, in the plenary. Any final comments? Uh, we need to find a way for me to hire like six more people to work with me. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what is written in the EOSC Future Ethical Plan, but maybe you can consider cloning. I'm open to it. I, 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 then I could get some sleep. But I think more than one of me, yeah, maybe you might get a zombie apocalypse. I can't suggest it. Okay, I think, uh, shall we rejoin the main room then? Yeah, I think so. So thanks everybody for uh, contributing uh, to this very interesting uh, and useful because we, we have quite a long list of activity, all of them uh, on Owen, but that's fine. <laughs> Cloning could be an option after all. <laughs> See you back in the main room, I'll panic quietly. <laughs> okay. See you all. Okay.
Okay. Um, I think everyone from the um, from the policy breakout has already joined. Um, I want to ask if the technical breakout has already concluded its discussions. Yes, we we finished a bit early, so we were in a short break, seven minutes break. Yeah. Very lucky. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, I think. Um, well, it's it's now twelve thirty. I suppose we can commence with some of the wrap up uh, from the different uh, breakout uh, sessions. Um, are you? Is the technical breakout already ready with its uh, points? Yes, I think we are. Okay. Yes. So we discussed uh, several things. I think the most hot topic right now is uh, PIDs that were discussed both in the in the chat but also during the, the session, that is uh, PIDs for services. And uh, let's say for this, we have an action point that is to uh, organize an ad hoc meeting. Yes, thank you. Okay. So we would like to organize an ad hoc meeting for PIDs. And um, then we have these um, these other things, these other topics that we have discussed. That is, uh, for example, that is how can a catalog operator act on behalf of the service providers, which credentials have to be used. And uh, here we had that this question was uh, uh, answered partially by the presentations that were heard before. And so we, they should use a, a token, a specific token. And the action point that came from this discussion was to document a procedure that will be used by the NIFOS pilot. And, um, and yes, document this so that the others can replicate what, is what has been uh, done. OK. And also, uh, there is a deliverable which is currently being uh, led by Dusan, that is due uh, in these days, that will also include uh, some documentation on this process. So this uh, deliverable will be public and accessible to everybody, and everybody will be able to, to read it. And uh, also another topic was about the, um, the API, actually, both of the um, the semantics of the API. So if we have some kind of query language that can be used uh, to query the services that have been changed between a time range or to flag the, the entries that have been changed so that other catalogs can fetch. or And also if these APIs should be push or pull. So what what we have discussed is that probably we need the both. We need the, uh, both a pull, API, put pull APIs and push APIs so that um, this uh, interoperability can be, uh, can get its full potential, can, yes, can get at its full potential. And uh, so for, for this discussion, we have action points that concern the, um, the, the API uh, so we will have um, a dedicated meeting to define what is needed on APIs. Okay, and uh, just 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 to comment on on this dedicated yes, meeting is is more that not only on we will not go through all the details of the dedicated meeting of the the, the details of the API, but more to see okay how can we evolve on the APIs in the future and how can we set up a group uh, so that we can discuss this and that all stakeholders uh, are involved in this these type of discussions okay thank you and uh, last but not least um, we the idea was to have something. Uh, the idea is to uh, we said what 
what can the regional projects do in the meantime? Is there something that we can do so to facilitate this integration between catalogs? And what we came up was with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, redo what the NIFOS pilot will do also in the other catalogs. And also to have a, a, a meeting to uh, summarize the changes in the profiles and so that we enhance, enhance and future will invite people from their projects uh, to summarize the changes in the profiles, yes. Great. I think this is all for the technical breakout session. Excellent, thank you very much. I see that there are actually quite a number of uh, similar actions that in fact, have been, uh, have been adopted also in the other breakout. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Federica to perhaps summarize um, some of the confirmed policy actions and, and the timeline from the other breakout. Yeah, um, so uh, also in our session, we discussed quite a number of, uh, of actions. Uh, the, the focus was uh, um, mainly on two key points. Uh, one uh, is um, the, the role uh, of, uh, of the actors involved in the, in the process and uh, let's say the, the devolution uh, and the relations between uh, um, service providers, uh, um, national or thematic catalogs uh, and uh, uh, the central one, so uh, and how we can capture these uh, relations uh, also with uh, relevant agreements. The other one is the extent uh, of information we need uh, to, to collect, uh, how the collection is done, uh, and uh, uh, how to avoid uh, to create, uh, let's say, artificial barriers to uh, to the onboarding of services because we ask uh, uh, too much information or uh, duplicate information uh, or we just uh, clarify why any information is needed uh, and what can be checked uh, and what can be certified. So we, we do have uh, um, a number of um, of actions confirmed. Uh, most of them uh, uh, must be uh, initiated uh, uh, by US Canons and US Future. But uh, the important point uh, that uh, it will state uh, is that uh, participation uh, in the definition of, uh, of many of these aspects uh, should be extended uh, to the other projects uh, that, that are dealing with catalogs. So uh, on one end, uh, we were joking about uh, cloning um, <laughs> Owen, but on the other, uh, I think that what really came out here is that uh, this is a joint effort and we need to agree our policies. So we have a quite a tight timeline for the actions. So um, there is um, a plan to organize uh, um, a follow-up meeting um, for um, the implementation of uh, PIDs from also the policy point of view. Um, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, from our perspective, would involve uh, the, um, the definition uh, of uh, agreements uh, with the PID operator. Um, we are not there yet, so this is something, uh, this is just a memo about the topics we want to cover in uh, this future meeting. Um, another important point uh, was to redevelop the profiles uh, uh, in, uh, again, uh, as a joint collaborative uh, effort uh, into uh, some, uh, something uh, which was more modular and uh, uh, let's say create a sort of uh, uh, minimum viable profile uh, to use uh, uh, a much abused uh, <laughs> term. And uh, 
and this is uh, an action uh, that should start to happen soon, but uh, there is quite a, a co-creation process uh, here. So uh, it will start soon, uh, but uh, it won't be so quick. Uh, another point uh, uh, was to um, explore the implications uh, uh, of service provider agreements uh, or MOUs, uh, which will be used uh, in the first phase before the um, USC Association uh, starts to really manage uh, the, the, the catalog. And uh, um, this also uh, is another of the points uh, I was mentioning uh, where the um, enlargement of the um, of the table of the task force involved uh, is uh, mandatory. Um, this uh, was um, uh, this action uh, was taken um, by Yusk Nordic, but again, uh, it would be a joint effort. Another action uh, on Yusk Future will be to implement a shared space uh, for documentation. And uh, everybody agrees uh, that this would be beneficial uh, and uh, they are looking forward to, to adopt and use it uh, as a point of reference. This will happen in September. And then uh, we have uh, other actions uh, uh, for October and November, so quite an hot autumn, I, I would say. So uh, uh, the October action will be to agree on a template and the format of this uh, uh, agreement that will uh, be used uh, until the end of um, year's future. And uh, last but not least, uh, the action for November is um, to modify the, the, the template uh, to include uh, an intermediate level uh, between the legal entity and uh, um, the, the actual people uh, he, uh, which will be on board service, services for large organizations. Of course, uh, this won't change anything uh, for a small service provider, but uh, it will simplify and make more transparent the process for bigger institutions. And I think it's, this is all, which is quite a lot of stuff, actually. Thank you very much, Federica. So we now have our agenda up until the next year, uh, basically. Um, lots of actions for the portal operators there, but quite a few as well on a number of projects. And as mentioned, uh, this will indeed be a collaborative effort among all. So um, what are the next steps? Basically, this uh, confirmed set of actions, both on the policy and technical side, will be passed over to the um, Infraeus 5 uh, onboarding task force to um, take forward. Um, especially for, for the actions there and to follow up. Um, and uh, everything, including the, uh, the presentations, as well as the, um, the recording of the breakouts. So for those who weren't able to join the other breakout, you can uh, view the recordings on the EOS Pillar event page um, in this, uh, within this week. So um, I think we're, we're well over our time now, uh, but I'd just like to thank everyone who was present here today um, thank you very much for your insights and for uh, sharing uh, the opinion and the views of your projects um, and, and basically providing us with a very lively discussion today. Thanks as well for our, um, for our uh, facilitators who have facilitated the breakouts and have provided us with the next um, set of, um, of actionable um, items uh, for the next coming months. Um, and thank you to also to the other projects um, that have co-organized this with us, specifically EOSC, um, EOSC Future, EOSC Enhance, um, the other regional projects, MIFOS Europe, um, EOSC Synergy, um, as well as EOSC Nordic. So from, from all of us here, 
thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to um, engaging with you again in our next event. Thank you all. Bye and have a good lunch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.